everyone. Welcome to the 303rd episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And today is a little bit of a departure. We are not at CES, but my power is out because of a downed tree. So we're actually recording under somewhat CES-like conditions, which are basically less than ideal. Wait, 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 wait a second. I'm actually in North Hall. The lights are out, and I was wondering where everybody was. Oh, Kevin, if you don't have the (laughs) coronavirus, you should make your way home. Uh, Okay, so we have an amazing show for you. We are going to be talking about a lot of CES news. We also have a little bit of news related to an acquisition by Qualcomm. So I'm going to talk about it because I love chips. And then we'll hear from one of our sponsors, TerraCode. And we have our guest is Vinka Gizman, who is president and co-founder of The Things Network. And we're going to be talking about Laura and Sidewalk and basically LP WANs, because who can't get enough of LP WANs? That would be me. Um, And basically all of y'all, because we get a lot of questions where the answer is, ooh, an LP WAN would help. But before we do any of that, we're going to hear from our sponsor, This week's sponsor is Tech Memes Ride Home Podcast. And let me just tell you, when The New Yorker magazine asked Mark Zuckerberg how he gets his news, he said the one news source he definitely follows is Tech Meme. And I'm no Mark Zuckerberg, and I'm okay with that. But I also get my news from Tech Meme, and so does Kevin. So for three years and nearly 800 episodes, the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast has really helped anybody who doesn't spend all day on the site get up to date on the latest news in tech in 20 minutes or so. I know we're not really commuting anymore, but in 20 minutes, you could make at least half of your dinner, or maybe that's your getting morning ready routine. I don't know. But you probably care about tech news just as much as Kevin and I do. So check out the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast. It's all the top stories, the top posts and tweets and the conversations about those stories, as well as behind the scenes analysis. So search your podcast app now for Ride Home and subscribe to the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast. All righty, let's talk about CES because my goodness, we're not there. No one's there. We've had, it's, let's see. It's weird. It's, it's just so weird. weird. I, yeah, I I don't know what to say. I mean, I feel, I'll be honest. Parts of it are really convenient. My feet don't hurt. But it's still an overwhelming amount of content, even though they're like almost half the number of participants, right? Right. They ex- they typically have like 4,500 exhibitors. And that doesn't count all, all the little booths and everything. This year they have 1,900, so not even half. And from our perspective, it's, it's great to not have to walk around 40 miles during the week and all that, but we miss out on seeing the products, holding the products, asking questions. It's just really weird. Yeah. I feel like vaporware, like CES is always a time of like, Hey, we're going to launch this. And you're like, when are you going to launch it? And they're like, I don't know, September, but I feel like vaporware gets a, it's a a lot easier this year. Cause it's not like I can even hold your 3d prototype, 3d printed prototype and say, Oh, when can we expect this? But let's talk about some of the things that we saw that we thought were worth talking about. We'll start with, you know, this is on, we wrote a story about it, but some of the bigger smart home news things, there's a ton going on in your bathroom. We're just going to start at the bathroom. <laughs> the thing... Yeah, there, there's too much going on in your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. You may not want to share this with everyone. But the biggest thing I was excited about, because now I live in this rainy, cold climate, is the Kohler Stillness Tub. And this isn't even that smart. Honestly, the thing that's most exciting about it is it's a ginormous 48-inch by 48-inch tub that you can... <laughs> It fills from the bottom. So that's cool, right? Mm -hmm. There's no spout. It just like gurgles up from the bottom. And the smarts come into play if you buy like for $16,000, you can get the max stillness tub package, which involves infinity, which means the water will stream over the sides of your tub into a grate. And there are connected lights that work with Madam A and Google and whatnot. That is the tub I want. That requires 72 by 72 inches of space. I don't have that. That is too fancy for me. Oh my gosh, I would live in that tub. <laughs> <laughs> next next week, Stacey will be recording from the tub. 
from the bathtub because she's converted her office into a tub room. Um, okay, so that's what that's that's like the big thing. But they also because it's COVID, Kohler, Moen, all these other companies related to bathroom fixtures, they are doing touchless faucets. Some of them are retrofits, some of them are new. But basically, just stick a you know. And again, this is just a sensor. You wave your hand in front of it, and poof, water comes out. You can also tie these into Madam A or Google. And I'm not so germaphobic at the moment, but I am excited. Like, I do think it'd be kind of neat to be like, hey, G, fill my tub at 104 degrees, you know, because it takes a long time and it could just start happening. And um, you've, you've had the benefit of using a touchless faucet in your kitchen. And yes. you've explained some of those benefits. So at, at first, I would say this is not something I'd be interested in. But based on your experiences, yeah, I could see it in the bathroom, too. Why not? Yeah. And in the kitchen, it's nice because it it meters out the water. So you can ask for two tablespoons or two cups and it, it just meters that out. And Moen actually announced a voice activated faucet at CES as well for the kitchen. So those are the faucets. Now let's talk toilets. Kohler launched a touchless toilet thing where, I mean, we see these all the time. This is a little less scary than the ones in public restaurant restrooms where, you know, you sit down and then like the toilet suddenly flushes. It's like, ha ha. And you're like, ah, this one is a actual flusher. And then you wave your hand by the flusher and the flusher flushes. So it's a little bit more, it's a less scary uh, <laughs> or surprising. Yeah, we've, seen, we've seen that before. I mean, yes. It, yeah. Out in, in, you know, public venues and whatnot. So it's not. Now it's in your home, but Toto has this concept toilet and this is, this is vaporware, like nobody's business, but their concept toilet is you deliver your outputs to the toilet as they delicately put it. And the toilet says it analyzes those. Now, I guess their inputs. Um, it analyzes them and says, Hey, your diet looks unbalanced. Here's a recipe for a salad. And I wish I were being sarcastic because this is my sarcastic version of what a smart toilet would do for people. And, and part of me is really excited about stuff like this because I think less so in the home, but I think in like nursing homes and hospitals, having the ability to measure like dehydration in a toilet is a really interesting opportunity. And also, I mean, we've even seen some wastewater plants and such recently through university projects determine if there was COVID in the population and whatnot. So there's, there's a whole other side of this that could be useful. Yeah. So, and, and I did a, the EPA actually has a big thing online about that. And one of the challenges there though, one is they're still trying to figure out how to measure it in causation and correlation there. But the other thing is they're pulling samples every 24 hours and they're running, it's not electronic. It's a, it's a, it's a scientific test. So we would have to develop a sensor to fit in the toilet that would be able to measure, to look for basically RNA fragments. I'm not saying we can't do it, but nothing like that exists right now. So, And neither does this toilet. So, Neither does this toilet. So, But there are actually Metal May powered toilets. You can have it, you know, Kohler has one. I don't even want to talk about it. Smart toilets. <laughs> They're still a thing. Crap um, in equals crap out. Yeah. So let's move out of the bathroom. Is it time to move out of the bathroom? Can we do that? Oh, yet? yes, we should. <laughs> Let's go to the kitchen and the rest of the home. Let's see. So we saw a bunch of new appliances with new connections. Samsung has some interesting stuff, including a robot that I thought you were excited about. This is also still in development. Oh, the uh, bot handy. Yes. Yeah. Now this is in development and, but they say it will be delivered. But then again, I think I've seen robots on the Samsung press stage three years in a row, and I haven't yet seen any of those come to market. So be that as it may, I do want the bot handy. So this this is a roving robot, which is something I've wanted for a long time. I want a smart roving robot in my house with a digital assistant built in, some sensors. This actually adds an arm with a gripper hand. And using sensors at the top of the of the robot, and the, the robot is like a round, almost like a robot vacuum platform, but then a, a stalk on the top is the, the robot itself with a little happy face and sensors at the top. Well, that, that stalk or trunk can actually rise up. So that way the hand can reach higher things. It can go back down to reach things on the floor. And the sensors inside, again, using AI, can analyze what it sees and detect 
objects and also what they're made of or what they presume they're made of. And what Samsung showed off Again, this is all canned footage that they showed, was the bot handy grabbing plates out of the sink, dirty dishes, and putting them in the dishwasher for you, and then closing the dishwasher. I see a lot of potential here for small, menial-type tasks, and that's great. You know, they're showing it pouring wine and picking up laundry and dropping in the hamper, because it knows what clothing is. It knows what a hamper is, presumably. My question is, A, how much will it cost? Uh, the answer is going to be too much for me. B... How much will a consumer have to program this thing or teach it to do things? Or will it come with certain functionality built in? That's a totally open-ended question right now. Yeah. How does it learn your house and the motions required to do things? I would also say a lot of those things, I look at it as quote unquote puttering and I love puttering. I, Me too. I, I like running through the house, picking stuff up. I mean, I get it. Like right ahead. If someone's coming over and it's a surprise, I'm like, ah, clean. That's less enjoyable. But, and you know, Jeff Bezos is a fan of puttering. He actually sets aside time in his schedule to putter as well. I don't know if he's like loading the dishwasher and picking up clothes off the floor, but I'd like to think he is. I wouldn't think this is going to change the world. It's more of a potential convenience factor, I suspect. Yeah. All right. Yeah, also in the kitchen, June, the maker of Kevin's and my smart ovens that we I'm going to go with Adore. I adore my June. Yes, um, we adore it. My wife does as well. The company was purchased this week by Weber, the maker of grills. And June has had a partnership with Weber for a couple of years. They make Weber has introduced last year a smart grill that uses June's OA operating system and technology. And the plan is for the ovens to still be manufactured and things will continue on. It's just that June has now been purchased by Weber. So they're, they're going to be run as like a separate entity under the Weber brand is what I gathered. Yeah. This wraps up what I'm going to call like, I'm feeling like it's the end of an era. And I say this because just two weeks ago, I got an email from Jason Johnson, who was the founder and CEO of August. And August was acquired by Asa Abloy, which is the parent of Yale Lux. And Jason's lockup had, had ended and he's moving on to like do his own thing. He doesn't know what it is yet. And I was like, oh, I remember visiting his company when it was just a, a twinkle in his eye, right? And <laughs> it's the same with June. And now it's acquired. And, you know, Allegiant just acquired You Know Me. And I think these deals that we don't know the terms of the June deal. I think I saw in an article that the founders did all right. And I just, I feel like we've seen the creation of some new devices, but nothing has like blown the top of the world off, right? Like nothing crazy has happened yet. So I feel like we're ending, if we think about the first era was the Google acquired Nest era of the smart home. Now we're ending like with these like smaller, cool devices that are a little bit iterative and I, I don't know what comes next. So I, I just was feeling a little nostalgia related to that. Yeah, I, I hope that, and, and I think that this is part of the acquisition reason, um, that this opens up the distribution channels for June, maybe production, faster production, because they got the new ovens out and it's all pre-order and send us an email and we'll let you know when it's ready and, and whatnot, and more developer resources, because we had, um, wasn't Matt Van Horn on our, um, he was. one of our events in October? Yeah. Right. And I had asked him, like, hey, you know, how about getting Google support on there? You know, not just Madame A. And, you know, he's like, well, it's a matter of time and resources and priorities. And, well, hopefully they can do that and things like that. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so let's see. I don't want to talk. We, we did a story. The only other thing for that story that I'm really excited about that I think everybody in the podcast will also be excited about is Alarm.com released a sensor that uses LTE and it, you don't have to have an alarm, alarm.com security system to use this, but you will have to go through a distributor to buy it. But what this is, is it's a standalone LTE based sensor for $130, or that's the MSRP. And there will be a subscription associated with it. But for everybody who wants like open close sensor on their shed door, but it's too far from their Wi Fi network, this is going to solve that problem. Or maybe you want to, you have a gate or you want to check like cars passing into your driveway. These are the kind of things that you might be able to do with that. So I'm just throwing that out there. It's a thing that exists. If you want it, you just need to go call an alarm.com distributor in your area. They're going to sell you the device and they'll also handle the subscription related. 
I feel like a lot of DIYers are not going to be like super jazzed about this, but I could be wrong. Well, we do get a lot of calls and questions about um, sensors that are just too far for from the home Wi-Fi network. So how can they communicate, you know, on the internet? And you know, we've talked about LoRaWAN, we've talked about Sidewalk Labs, future type things. This is this is here now, so this is a, a new thing. Yeah. So let's see. What else should we talk about? What you want to talk about wireless sensing? We saw a couple things related to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Linksys, uh, they have their subscription service. It's, what is it, Linksys Aware for like $3 a month, I believe. Yes. Um, they, they're adding a feature that will allow your, uh, Linksys devices to literally send out wireless signals and then determine if there's movement in the home based on that and even where that movement is. Um, and this is something we've been talking about and kind of wanting for some time because from a security standpoint, you want to know if somebody's in your home, but you may not want things like cameras that give up too much of your own personal privacy. So there's no cameras involved here. This is all wireless imaging, so to speak. And along the same lines, a company called Hex came out with a new product at CES that does the same thing. Um, I believe they started back in 2013 as a different company, but... They're actually Origin Wireless. So the company's name is Origin and the system is called Hex. Okay. So basically you, you get these wireless imaging pucks and they're very small. Like the main one is four inches and small little pucks are like two inches. And they basically do nothing but send out wireless signals and read who is moving, not who, but that somebody is moving around where they're moving around, send you notifications. And it's basically a, a smarter or different type of security system. Those pucks are going to start for one, $59.99, $59.99, I believe, for a small home and range up to like $259, depending on how many you need. But it's not going to be available till summer, um, which I'm disappointed by because I really would like to try it. Yeah. And I, I should mention, because we've seen this before, I think either 2014 or 2015 CES, Cognitive Systems launched a security system called, it was either, I think it was called Aura. And that was what it did. And what happened is it, the system was, eh, all right. It used its RF disruption to say, hey, this is where someone is in your home. What happened was they pulled the security system. And what they did is they took the technology and started, it, they did a deal with Qualcomm. And Qualcomm is now embedding that technology into routers. And so we're going to see more of this going forward. You know, I've talked to the CEO of Cognitive. There are other companies. There's this company that's behind Hex. There's another company. And I think this is something to keep an eye on, not just with Wi-Fi signals, but other RF. Like last week on the show, we had someone ask us about fall detection. And that one of the devices we suggested is from a company called Viar or Vair. And they actually do similar RF sensing. They just use a different spectrum band. So this is going to be a big deal going forward. I think it'll be really interesting to see how well it works, especially as we add more and more RF into our homes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, okay. Oh, should we talk about pet doors? <laughs> oh, okay. So every year at CES, there's always a product or two where I'm like, no, nah, that's a joke, right? That's a joke. But this is not a joke. And this comes from the Chamberlain MyQ folks. I I don't know what to say. The MyQ Pet Portal, which is literally an entire door. You you buy a exterior door and replace your current exterior door with this. And at the bottom of the door is built in almost like elevator doors for your pet. And there's sensors. Your pet wears a Bluetooth collar and the door can open or you can say you can remotely open the door, you know, because maybe your pet is only allowed out at certain times. It's three thousand dollars. You also get a tracker, though, that says your dog went out X number of times a day. (laughs) But it's $3,000. This is a lot. Okay. So I have a dog. I've had a dog door in three of my homes. One of my homes, I had a custom dog door. By that, I meant I bought a dog door and we had a custom door maker make the door and stick with the hole for the dog door. That cost me about $1,000. And... In my latest house, I actually cut a hole in the outside wall of my house and installed the door. The door was about, I want to say, $50 to $80. And then the Mm -hmm. physical labor of having someone cut through and do the trim and all that was maybe $1,000. So we still haven't (laughs) 
<laughs> gotten to the level of this door. Um, I will say that some people really worry about like letting, I live in a rural area, so it's possible a raccoon may enter through my dog door and wouldn't that be exciting? Sure. So, but we've seen Bluetooth enabled dog doors for a long time. That is not a new yep. thing. And I just, this seems like overkill. It's fancy though. It, it, the door opens like an elevator. <laughs> It, it seems, yeah, third floor, dog biscuits. It's like, it just seems so over-engineered to me for what it is. And, and that's why the price is the price. But It's the Juicero of dog doors. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, they do, give, they do give you, and it's a $200 value, a one-year MyQ video storage subscription. So you can see your dog going in and out. I have, a, I have a $30 Wise Cam that I set up by my dog door to track how often my dog goes in and out. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you could buy a hundred wise cams for the price of this. Yeah. But you know, we got to subtract the thousand dollars for like the other door. The door. Yeah. 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 So, you know, we're, we're getting there, Kevin. We're going to get there. Okay. There was some other pet tech, you know, the do connected dog collars are coming a long way. If you're interested in that, they had a connected dog collar that also tracked the pets sleeping and movements and their barks and it would interpret their barks to tell you if your pet dog was sad. This is by Pulse Pet and it is $99 for a small one, $108 for a big one. And there's also a collar called the Fi Collar, F-I. And this, I didn't see at CES. I've seen a couple other places, but this is about $100 and then there's a subscription fee, but this is a cellular collar that's actually not a terrible size for a dog, even a smaller dog, maybe not a Chihuahua. <laughs> Think about 25 to 25 pounds and up or a really furry dog. I don't know. I anticipate that Amazon will have a Sidewalk Labs dog collar available at some point. Yeah, that was a demo thing. So fetch. So don't buy a connected dog collar just yet. Okay, let's see. What else do we have from CES? We have some news from Ring. We do have some news from Ring. It's not really new device news. It's actually uh, new security news, which is always good. So... Ring is launching video end-to-end -end encryption for some of their products. And I just want to be clear, they, they actually already do offer end-to-end -end encryption for the video when your video is uploaded to the cloud and when it's stored on Ring servers. What this new feature does is it gives you, uh, it lets you enroll your mobile device with a special pass key. And without that pass key, your videos cannot be viewed on any mobile device. So oh, wow. you can be, yeah, so you can be ensured that nobody's going to sign into your Ring account with another device and just look at all your stuff that's stored in the cloud, right? So this is for, let me go through real quick, the Ring Video Doorbell Pro and Elite, the Floodlight Cam, the Spotlight Cam Wired, Cam Plugin, Cam Elite, and indoor cam. Any battery powered video doorbells, they're not going to support end to end this type of end to end encryption on. That's interesting. So like, I wonder if even like this is subpoenaed, then it's no longer Ring's decision to like release the files to a police agency. Because I, I wonder if this is in response to that, or if this is in response to people having terrible passwords and their cameras getting hacked. So I don't know what it's in response to, but in terms of subpoenas and such, I suspect that they cannot hand over the video or they can hand it over, but it will be encrypted because if you lose your passphrase, there is no way to recover it. You have to start over and re-enroll mobile devices. Wow. I mean, that's hardcore, but it's also like a super safety thing. I don't think a lot of people are going to do it. Probably not, because if they lose the passcode, and it becomes a hassle. And they even say, Ring says, you might lose access to videos that you've already recorded if you lose your passcode. I like this. I do think we have to figure out a better way to train people on password, keeping passwords for a long period of time and recovery. And I say that because I just saw the story in the New York Times about people losing passwords for their Bitcoin wallets. Um, yes, which so. is that one guy's <laughs> wallet is worth $220 million right now and he can't access it. Yeah, I was like, oh, I know that guy. Oh, no. That's a shame. Uh, that is a shame. Um, he had other Bitcoin. Anyway, um, so... There's that. The other thing I want to say about Ring is last week I did the Ring mailbox sensor review because of a weirdness in my Amazon Madam A account on my phone. It's crazy slow. So when I tried to actually create the notification, so if I got mail, my Amazon Echo would announce, you have mail. Um, I said you couldn't do it, but that's not actually true. I just 
I must have hit the wrong button because in my routines, I was not able to get to that place. But if you go to the Madam A app, you create a routine. And instead of having you talk to Madam A, you pick smart home, and then you pick the mailbox sensor. You can actually turn that to detected and then create a thing where Madam A will speak to you and say, you've got mail. She doesn't say it like the AOL thing, but that's kind of what I like to imagine. Okay. Any other CES news? Oh, there is. There's energy harvesting news. Y'all know I'm so excited about energy harvesting because I think batteries are, they're terrible for the IoT because you can't stick, you know, a couple hundred thousand sensors places and then have to change all their batteries every six months. It's not going to happen. So Sequins, which makes modems, and an energy harvesting company called, I'm going to go with EPS, E-P-E-A-S. They actually demonstrated an energy harvesting LTE M and NBIOT modem. That's a big deal. That means you have a cellular modem that can run on temperature changes or solar or, I mean, you've had those for a while, but this is an integrated system. And that means it'll be cheaper and smaller and more efficient. And we're excited about this. I don't know if this is going to actually exist or not, but well, it's definitely a step in the right direction for the reasons that you mentioned, um, but it's still limited because the collected data from the sensor can only be sent up to eight times a day without a battery. So it's not the kind of thing yet where you can get information every few minutes and so on, but it is awesome. Yeah. And still at eight times a day, though, you can do something, you know, like I'm thinking temperature changes. You could also like check the status of something. And you can also use it to like wake up and say something. And then you could actually activate something that is maybe battery powered that can give you more information. So think of things like fire detection, right? If this sensor checks eight eight times a day and is like, is anything on fire? Is anything on fire? Oh my God, it's on fire. Then it wakes up something (laughs) else. Right. I'm excited. Okay. Is that all our CES news? I believe that's it because, again, it was like a quarter of the show that we usually see. It's And it was just, I don't know how to describe it, surreal to just watch videos and such. Yeah. I, I think I tweeted that binge watching CES sucks and I stand by that statement. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I will say, I will say, I did hear one interesting thing. So, well, I heard lots of interesting things, but this stuck with me. The CTO of Bosch um, was talking about their self-driving car efforts. And he did a real level set for people, I feel. He mentioned that robo-taxis, like self-driving robo-taxis in dense urban areas, we're all excited about that, right? The, The total recall future. He says he doesn't even see that happening the first part of this century. So I remember like five years ago, we were all talking about, hey, we're gonna have self-driving cars by like now. And we don't. My daughter actually brought this up to us the other day. She's like, I think I'm going to have to get my driver's license. And you told me I wouldn't have to. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, we, we there was uh, the promise of this tech and we've seen it mature, but then it kind of has been held up because of either safety concerns that need to be addressed or the tech isn't performing the way it was expected to. And you can't, it's you, hard. obviously you cannot. Yeah, you can't take chances with people's lives like that. It's it's one one thing to have like a bad firmware update on a light bulb. That's not going to hurt anybody, right? Um, in most cases. But if all of a sudden driverless cars just go haywire or whatever, yeah, big problem. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It was interesting. Oh, also in wireless sensing, there was a connected lamp. Yeah, it was the Nobi Light, N-O-B-I. It's a smart lamp. It's basically you retrofit your existing uh, lamps in your home. So, you know, like flush mounts or overhead cans and whatnot. And this claims to do fall detection, which is something we were looking into last week for somebody. It's got monitoring, 24 by 7 monitoring. Um, there's no camera. It's not really watching. It's using, again, wireless signals. But it's expensive. I mean, I think it, they said to outfit the average apartment was like $2,100 or something to that effect. Or you can rent the bulbs and, and or rent these things and get the monitoring service for $119 a month. That's, I mean, I'm I'm all for fall detection, but that's 
uh, yeah, how about wallet detection? That's yeah. tough. We'll wait for Linksys Aware at $3 a month to add that on for another yes, five. please. Yeah. All right. But it is, I mean, that's to show where this technology is going. You are going to see it in more places and that's probably to the best. All right. So that's CES so far. I'm sure we're going to talk a few more things next week, but let's talk about chip news because this isn't exactly IoT, but you know, I, I got into IoT because of the silicon industry. So we're going to talk about it very briefly. Two big deals happened on Wednesday when we recorded the show. The first, Intel replaced its CEO, Bob Swan, who was not there very long, with Pat Gelsinger. I only say this because Pat Gelsinger, man, this this guy headed up VMware, <laughs> this guy headed up EMC. So I don't know, maybe he's going to sell Intel to Dell. No, that is not going to happen, y'all. But the point is, Pat Gelsinger is like a legit godfather in the tech industry. So Intel is like, help us, please, Pat. And Pat graciously will help. Um, we'll see how that goes. Two, Qualcomm acquired a startup called Nuvia for $1.4 billion. I'm saying this because Nuvia makes a CPU. Qualcomm has also historically made a really awesome CPU. The Snapdragon CPUs inside most of your phones up until <laughs> Apple started making their own. And the Nuvia founders were actually from Apple's chip design team. And Qualcomm is buying this and plans to put Nuvia CPUs inside their high-end smartphone chips. And it's also going to bring them into the server business a little bit more. Qualcomm has been working on server chips using the ARM technology for a while. And it's been going all right. It's still a it's still tough to get people to buy ARM-based servers. They're getting better. Um, and like I said, Nuvia does use the ARM architecture license. So this isn't like an a rejection of ARM. This is just like Qualcomm saying, you know what? We've been really good at designing uh, CPUs for smartphones for a while, but smartphones are taking on more jobs and we want to get into this server market like nobody's business. And so let's let's buy Nuvia and re-architect. So it's a big deal. And, and their big claim to fame is similar to the Apple M1 claim to fame, and that is a lot of performance on very low power. Yes, that's, that's what we're all looking for. So yep. maybe one day we'll have energy harvesting computers. Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that is all of our news and CES up to this point. CES is still going on for another day or two, so we probably will talk about it next week. So now let's go to the IoT voicemail hotline, which is sponsored by Very. The IoT podcast hotline is brought to you by Very. Very is a fully distributed IoT engineering firm helping you get your biggest projects fully operational, on time, and on budget. Discover what Very's multidisciplinary teams can do at www.verypossible.com. That's www.verypossible.com. And if you want to leave a message on the IoT voicemail hotline, please give us a call at 512 623-7424. If you call us and leave us a question or a comment, you will be in the running for a your choice of a $99 smart speaker, be it from Google, Amazon, or Apple. And that ends at the end of the month. So don't wait to get your call and question in. Again, that's 512-623-7424. This week's question is from Tom about adaptive lighting with Lutron Caseta. Well, hi, Kevin and Stacey. This is Tom. I am from bucolic Buffalo Grove, Illinois, the Chicago suburb with no buffaloes and no groves. Anyway, I love your podcast, and I have a quick question. So all of our wall lights, ceiling lights, and table lamps are controlled by wonderful Lutron Caseta. It's so good. But here's my question. If I replace all of our bulbs with tunable white bulbs, would it be possible to use Apple's adaptive lighting to change the color of the bulbs throughout the day and still use Lutron Cassetta, of course? Thanks. Okay, Tom. I have... I, I have bad news. I'll just, I'll just tell you. Bad news for you. <laughs> you can't do this. Um, it's very simple. You can do it. That's all. No. Uh, I had long wanted to do this not not that, but many years ago, I tried to use Lutron switches and Philips Hue bulbs, actually. So your exact situation or possibly your exact situation. And it didn't work. And I called Lutron and they were like, yeah, it's basically a too many chefs in the kitchen 
problem. You can't have a smart switch and a smart bulb at the same time. Yeah, I mean, well, there's hope, though. There's yeah. hope oh, because... Yes. Kevin, you're like the good cop. I'm the bad cop. You're the good cop. <laughs> Tom, Stacy says no. Kevin says yes. I, I say maybe because at Apple HomeKit's adaptive lighting is being enabled with firmware updates to bridges and products such as Philips Hue and Eve products. Those are the most recent ones that I think came in uh, December of last year, November, December. So it is possible that Lutron does a firmware update to their bridge or their switches that bring adaptive lighting. I have not seen any news on that. I, I don't know if they will. I hope they do. But again, that will be done with regular bulbs. So they won't be tunable. So one of the features of adaptive lighting is if you have the right bulbs in place, they can work basically you can get daylight or super warm light. So with the Lutron in normal bulbs, you're just going to be able to dim it. And I don't know if adaptive lighting really matters in that case. Uh, I, I would take it. I'd take that over nothing. You would take some dimming. All right. So, so Tom, that's what I have to tell you. It's not ideal, but that's where it's at. And call, if you want this to change, you should call Lutron. They're actually, if you call their hotline, their support hotline, they are the smartest, nicest people who will answer all of your questions really well. Not that we aren't happy to do it, but then they'll also note that that's something you want. So they and tell them Stacy sent you. Yeah. <laughs> Stacy said don't, you're don't so nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that concludes this portion of the show, but please stay tuned for a message from our sponsor. And after that, our guest, Vinke. Gizman, who is president and co-founder of the Things Network. He's going to be talking about use cases for LoRa, the difference between LoRa and LoRaWAN, and whether or not Amazon's Sidewalk Network will ever become part of a LoRaWAN network. So much good stuff. All of this awaits you. Hey, everyone. We are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is TerraCode, and I have Michael Sack, who is the CEO and founder of TerraCode, here with us. And Michael, I would love for you to tell me a bit about how TerraCode can help companies implement their IoT strategies. TerraCode provides all of the services a company needs to start an IoT project, to speed up an existing project, and perhaps to solve challenges a company might be facing with a current IoT project. This means that we can help you define your project, help you make technology choices, help you implement that technology, develop the apps you need help you collect data and analyze that data to find ways to improve your business. We do a lot of rapid prototyping for clients. Excellent. So can you share an example of how you've done rapid prototyping and share some of the metrics so listeners can understand what's involved? Sure. We recently did a rapid prototype for an Ivy League university. They wanted to track skeleton keys that get lost by maintenance crews. They actually spend over $100,000 a year replacing these keys. Within two weeks, we had designed a solution, sourced the parts, and actually installed the system so that we could demonstrate it to their IT team so that they could trace keys on campus. We used something called Low Power WAN and LoRa. LoRa was a great solution for this use case because it sends data over very long distance. The cost to do this prototype was less than $10,000. Now we can pinpoint the keys on campus and trigger alerts when a worker leaves a key behind and there's no more key replacements. Excellent. Does the solution that you designed for the university offer them any other advantages? I think that's the beauty of the solution we designed. Once the campus has a few LoRa receivers up, we can collect anything over the network. For example, the university has a bunch of groundwater sensors and measurement devices that they use to track the potential for flooding on campus. Right now, they have to collect that data manually from each sensor. For about $10 a piece, we were able to hook up a LoRa transmitter that sends the data up over the same LoRa network we're using to track the keys. We can equip vehicles to track their location. We've actually uh, started a process of putting vibration sensors into the vehicles to determine when a vehicle hits a pothole. And when we find a pothole, we alert the, the crews that repair the roads to go out and fix those potholes. Inside the building, expensive equipment can be tracked and remotely managed using LoRa. And really, the possibilities for, for this school are endless, all leveraging the same fairly inexpensive LoRa network that we set up for their proof of concept. That's amazing. All right, Mike, where can I learn more about TerraCode, Low Power WAN, and the services that you provide? 
Go to terracode.com slash Stacy on IoT. We have a special offer where we'll do a free IoT audit. And again, that's terracode.com forward slash Stacy on IoT. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham. And today's guest is Vinka Giseman, who is the co-founder and CEO of The Things Network. Hello, Vinka. How are you today? Yeah, very good. Very good. Thanks for having me on the show, uh, Stacey. I am really excited. So I do want to give you a chance because you have the most amazing Dutch name, I'm assuming, ever. And I did not say it totally correctly. Do you want to tell people who you are so they understand who you are really? Yeah, for sure. Sure. And I, the real Dutch announcement is uh, Wienke Giesemann. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the co-founder and CEO of the, the Things Network. We are talking today all about LoRa and LoRaWAN. So first up, let's talk about what the Things Network is and why y'all started it. Yeah, so uh, Johan and I, Johan Stocking, uh, co-founder and CTO of the Things Network, we started in 2015. We uh, we saw this technology called LoRa and LoRaWAN, and um, we were charmed by the, the technology. And the technology is around that you can send small messages using very little power over a very long distance. And and we saw the technology, we were very excited. And then we saw also some initial ideas for use cases. And one of the first use cases was a smart mousetrap. So a mousetrap that tells when a mouse is caught. And and so we saw these, these, these use cases, we saw the interesting technology, but what we also saw it was that it was incredibly hard to build a product. And it was also very, very hard to build a go-to market in IoT. And uh, I just exited a company before that in media. So I, I created a, a company uh, that was actually a Netflix for the Netherlands. And then Netflix came to the Netherlands and then uh, we sold it to, um, to a Dutch publisher because, uh, because of course, we, we, didn't, we didn't win from Netflix here. And, and what we were so excited about is this IoT technology. And we also saw it's hard. So we thought, yeah, let's just build a developer ecosystem first. So just, let's just focus on making sure that we create tools for developers to make sure that their product development is easier, less risky, lower time to market. So we created all kinds of platforms. We created a Kickstarter with development devices to see if we can just make it easier and then see when we make it easier, what kind of business comes out of it. So we had a bit of a strange start of a company that we said, okay, let's just throw developer tools uh, at the market until it commercially sticks. And we did that with our organization, the Things Network first. And that, after that, when we saw that there was a clear need for commercial products and services, we started the company, the Things Industries. And this is a in the cloud world and the internet world, it's actually quite a well-known business model where you have an open source business model, uh, where you have an open source and an open platform. And for the enterprises, you have a, a enterprise and a, and a commercially oriented organization. And in five years, it just grew from starting in Amsterdam with a, with a small network, now having almost 30,000 gateways and 130,000 developers on the platform. Uh, and on our enterprise side, we have um, yeah many, many large customers around the world. Okay, so y'all started with developer tools, not a network, which I feel like with LoRaWAN, a lot of the startups like Sigfox, Senate, they all came out and they were like, we shall build a network. Um, I shouldn't say LoRa, I should say low power, wide area networks. So yeah. LP wins. LoRa is just one option up there. These companies came out, they built a network, and then they were like, the network is ready in this area. Please give us devices. And that that didn't work out really well at all, actually. It's very hard to build a new network. It's very cost inefficient when you're talking about tiny bits of data. There's there's very few people who want to spend a lot of money to send a piece of data from like a smoke alarm or something, right? So how did you address the the need to create both the market and the network at the same time? If you talk about what you say, the category of LP ones, it's um, it's been put from the start in the bucket of network operators because they were the first to adopt it. And as you say, if you look at the success of LoRa and LoRaWAN, that is actually not where it is. I, I am 100% sure that nobody is making mon money out of LP1 networks. There are all kinds of reasons uh, uh, to this. I think you mentioned them all. It's really hard to operate and it's really hard to 
a guarantee coverage. It's so really hard to make a, make a business model on top of it. But it's really easy to finance because you just get the, um, the telco ARPU-based uh, valuation models. You uh, get that Excel template and then you fill in IoT. And all of a sudden you get to these crazy valuations and you can get a lot of uh, funding. So that drove it. And that's really positive. It sounds, this sounds a bit negative, but it's not because it, I, I truly believe in that potential. What you now see is that most of the IoT and where LoRa and LP1 actually is really strong as in the last mile, is in the last part where you have that last little stretch of making sure you provide the connectivity. So we see a lot of traction in, for instance, restaurants, retail, farms, shopping mall, like sites that need a specific kind of connectivity that allows sensors to act on a battery for very long. There's just a, a, a massive growth. We had a bit of, uh, I think, in the especially in the retail and the hospitality and uh, and the restaurant business. Of course, this year was a was was not the best year there, but in 2000. 19, we had uh, a massive, uh, massive growth in these segments. So, uh, going back to your questions is that there, there's a, there's been a lot of framing and marketing around LP1 being a telco or a network focused technology. Uh, and we have never seen that. We, we think it's, it's, a, it's a great technology for the last mile. And that's why, and, and also building the networks and building, setting up the gateways yourself is actually so easy especially at scale, uh, and the capital expenses are very low, that it's just a, a very complementary technology to Wi-Fi. So let's talk about some of your customers and where they're using it and how they're using it. One of our customers focuses compliancy, and their best product is they help restaurant owners to make sure they have, in this case in the U.S. state, let's say state-specific uh, compliancy reports. And if you think around running a fast food restaurant or any restaurant at all, you like this kind of overhead of, in their case, measuring the temperature of the fridges and measuring the temperature at which, for instance, all kinds of food, raw meat, etc., is uh, kept, is, is overhead. So that can go up to, let's say, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 FTE that you have to account for as a, for your compliancy activities. If you have a sensor that will cost even 100 or $200 a month, then you already have a positive business case but because it's, it's directly saving on the operational expenses. So there, like that is a very strong example where you see that the business case is there, the technology is strong, the service levels are being met, and uh, where, where, where that's just really ready to scale. And that's happening at the moment. Another one we see in building management, optimization of workplaces. So for instance, one of our customers is WeWork. They, um, uh, they use it for measuring how their meeting rooms are really being used. Uh, and a meeting room also for them is overhead. But if they see that one of their places has too many meeting rooms, then converting that from meeting room to desk space is directly additional revenue. So there is where we see in, in, in smart buildings. Then agriculture, that's very, very broad from uh, tracking cows in Australia that are late, let's say, on these fenceless farms where like they just roam around anywhere, but you still need to check on their health and, and et cetera. Uh, we see a lot of use cases in farming around water, water management, uh, moisture sensing, measuring when to irrigate, and also measuring how effective that is. A lot of data comes from that. And we see that being used in vineyards and, and like high value crops, like, uh, for instance, like avoca uh, avocados and, and almonds and that kind of stuff. So yeah, really from facility management, smart building, agriculture, uh, of course, smart metering, that kind of stuff, logistics. So yeah, I can go on and on and on. Where There's even... One of our customers is called the it's a Willem, a Willemsen is one of the biggest uh, ship management companies, and we're helping them doing condition monitoring on ships. So, so yeah, it's it's super diverse. Wow. Okay. And the common denominator is they put these gateways in, they attach them to their existing networks, presumably. If they're going to use yep. the enterprise version, they call y'all for a license. They get the license. I've seen the marketplace on your site, so they buy the sensors from the marketplace. And then they manage them from a web dashboard they get from y'all. Yes? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the only thing is they don't buy the sensors from us. We just have partners that provide the sensors. We we don't want to be in between there as a marketplace because uh, that's just adding cost, and we're, we would not we would not be adding that much of value. So so mostly they they just go to the the vendors themselves. What I would say is the common de- de- denominator would be that they have a let's say undisclosed data problem. So they want to know something about their operations, which they most of the time they had to hire a field uh, service for, a force to check on that, like mouse traps or with a pencil and paper, write the temperature readings of a, of a fridge. And now all of a sudden they can access it way, way more easy. And that's the, that's the real common denominator. So on the, on the ship, it's for instance, the uh, condition of ventilation fans uh, so they can plan the maintenance of these moving parts a uh, way more efficient. In facility management, it's in the pest control part where they uh, only need to check on the traps or or uh, where where actually uh, the rodents are, are being caught. In the restaurants, it's that you don't need to bother and educate an employee in that specific restaurant to be able to fill in a compliance report. And LoRaWAN is, is able to offer that in a way that it is, it is the business case is very strong, right? And that I'm not talking about 10 or 20% efficiency, you know, like for instance, with these temperature sensors for uh, food compliance, we're talking about return on investments within a month, right? For innovation, you always need to have these very, very strong uh, business cases. So, so that is, that is, I would say, yeah, the common denominator, strong business case around undisclosed data. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about the consumer side. I know that's not what y'all do, but you've been doing a, a Laura-based network for, you know, five or six years. So I, I feel like you might have some thoughts. And we should start actually by telling people the difference between a Laura network and a Laura WAN network, because I think it's more confusing than it needs to be. Yeah, sure, sure. I think it's best to explain it around um, an example is that the LoRaWAN is the network protocol. So maybe if if people use uh, they use the internet, they, they might have heard of an IP address, and and that IP for IP address stands for Internet Protocol. And what that inter protocol Internet Protocol do, it do, does it makes sh- it makes sure that uh, the right data ends up at the right receiver. That protocol then talks to all the hardware switches and the cables and the Wi-Fi routers. But this the physical Wi-Fi router is talking is transmitting data in a physical way, and the internet protocol is making sure that is all managed. Now, so if you look at LoRa and LoRaWAN, LoRaWAN is like the internet protocol. So it's it's a protocol that makes sure that the data is secured that the data is routed in the right direction. So if your sensor or your mouse trap sends a message, it ends up in the right place in your ERP. And if you look at LoRa, LoRa is just the what we call the physical layer. And physical and radio is also is also through the air. So what it basically does, it uh, is able to put messages in a very special way on the air and that it can be received very far away using very little power. And and that's basic, basically the difference. Got it. So when we talk about LoRa networks, we're talking about, you know, just the basic network. And if we want things to interoperate on that network, so send any anything with the LoRa radio can send the data on that radio network. But if you want to actually have things see the data and understand it, you're going to have to be on LoRa WAN or if you're in a proprietary network, whatever the proprietary standard is, correct? Uh, so yeah, that's where the standards come in. So then let's talk about all the options out there. And the biggest one was announced not last year, but two Septembers ago now, um, when Amazon said it was going to build the sidewalk network. It was going to be a sub gigahertz network. They didn't really talk about it. And then their first sidewalk enabled device came out and we saw that it was a LoRa chip from Semtech. And everybody got really excited, but the protocol running on top of that is Amazon's protocol. I think it's a really exciting thing because I, as a consumer, have a need for a low power wide area network outside my home, right? I, I want to have sensors in my garden that that talk to things. People constantly ask us for 
mailbox sensors or sensors for their driveway, things that are just too far away from their house that they want to integrate into their smart home. So I guess what I'm curious about here is how do we make LoRa or maybe it's low power WANs accessible to the consumer? What needs to happen? Uh, our main focus is to also uh, paint a bit of a picture. What what is actually the difference between the enterprise world and uh, the consumer world? So, like the perfect case for us is you go into a restaurant, and if we can solve a problem where you can uh, use the 0.2 FTE to bring a better service instead of have somebody fill in a, in a compliance report. And if we can enable that with our network technology, that is what we do. We are not at all in the consumer electronics uh, market. But what my take on that, that is, is that uh, exactly as you're saying, it just the consumer just wants to make sure that it works. And Alexa, they, they did this very well. Ring did this very well. Um, Nest did this very well. And they got into the market. They created a market. They have tons of copycats or and that is bringing a huge amount of, of interesting use cases. I, I have a cat feeder in my house, which is like a Wi-Fi connected cat feeder. And it's just perfect. My my cat is like, I was, I now learned that I, I gave my cat way too much food and now it's like at its, at its good weight and it's like more healthy. And it's like, it's, it's literally made my life way better. And so, so yeah, that, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. And I think, I think adding the capability of LoRa to this Alexa uh, ecosystem, that just, just makes a huge amount of sense from a technology product perspective. And I think on top of that, except like this, this is more the, 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 the product and the proposition, what of course is, is super important for enterprise and for con- consumer is that, so what, what happens with the data? And in here in Europe, we have GDPR, which is a it's, it's a, actually a very simple privacy regulations that anybody can understand. Uh, and, and, and it looks like at the current architecture that they figured it out. But, but yeah, that, um, uh, that, that's always a very, very important uh, topic here. Okay, so the, the difference then is mostly around privacy and ease of use? No, I would say that privacy and security is that that's no different from 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 consumer and uh, and enterprise. I think the difference is in ease of use. I like it should literally be like, and this is what this is what Alexa did. Like you ask Alexa what to do, and it it just gives you what you need. We're getting new competition on the consumer side. I am interested in the idea that. The Laura Wan Alliance is asking Amazon to get involved with them, right? So saying, hey, can can we kind of push Sidewalk in this together and maybe one day we'll have one more open kind of standard? Do you think that might ever happen? Uh, I think in general, what I uh, can say around this is that we'll have fragmentation, and which is healthy, distributed, like a distribution and competition around different low power uh, power uh, technologies what is very beneficial for the market and when competition actually serves let's say the market and the people at some point it consolidates and when it consolidates you don't want to be forced to buy a whole new set of products or the vendors don't want to be forced in completely changing their technology so um, i'm in general in in favor of of uh, unification of this network protocol. And, and that would benefit all players at the moment. I think the opportunity at the moment is so big that anybody that's that's providing any sub gigahertz kind of technology, yeah, should be looking at how they can uh, leverage the standards that are already there in the market and partner. Maybe that's all right, Vinka. I feel like we have really talked about a lot of things and I do want to give you a chance because you are going to talk a lot more about Laura and the Things Network very soon. You want to tell us about that? So yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share. As um, we have the Things Conference, usually uh, 1,500 people come together from all around the world in Amsterdam first at the end of January. Now we're going to have the last week of January completely in a virtual event where you can learn all about building uh, IoT solutions with LoRaWAN that generate business value. Uh, we have a discount code and uh, it's in the description of, um, of this show. And uh, yeah, we'd love to see you all there. And you can find that discount code in the show notes. All right, Vinka, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's it for this week. 
Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. Thank you.